Can I tell you a funny Gorilla Glue story? And her parents were away. I, we were probably like juniors or seniors, and we had a huge party. And someone had like ripped the cabinet just completely off. We fucking Gorilla Glued it just shut. And they just discovered it this year. <laughs> gorilla Glue works, and it lasts a really long time. Super Clusters is the podcast to demystify the secrets, stories, and tactics behind the money that moves the venture capital world. Jacqueline Freeman Hester is a lawyer by training, but an investor at heart. She's a partner at Foundry Group focused on both direct and fund investments into phenomenal founders and fund managers, respectively. And in the words of your daughter, quote unquote, boss lady. Um, you might recognize her from her recent writing spree across Medium. Ten blog posts in two months between December and January, each that have helped me expand my own music repertoire. Um, and I am led to believe you will write many, many more. Um, she is a proud Kaufman Class 25 graduate, a mom, an avid fan of Red Rocks and Tedeschi Trucks Band, a skier, a golfer, and just to name a few. Today, I fear we'll only have a chance to scratch at the tip of the iceberg, but Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. I'm, I'm practicing. Let, let me know if I need to fill in <laughs> some of the gaps there as well. Um, I, I realize there's only so much you can glean from, from research online. Um, but one of the beauties of this podcast is that in many ways, I'm outmatched and outgunned here. And I absolutely love it. And today, in two things in particular, among many other things, is one, LP investing, and two, music. Um, so if you'll humor me for a second, we'll, be, we'll play around with this. Um, as someone who is a student of the artistic complexity of music and a lifelong fan of the band, if you'd, if you'd be open to it, I'd want you to play Hollywood music director, sound director, and take completely complete control over the jukebox for this episode. And so what I'll do is I'll give you a word or a scene or something to lead us into that question or conversation. And I want you to give me the genre of soundtrack that you think should be played in the background. And the, my editor will do the rest of it. So sound fair? I love that. I will, I will just state that when you have young children, they have literally eaten a piece of your brain in order to become humans. And so I've had three in five years. And so I will I will draw blanks, but I will do my best. Um, I have my moments where I can come up with stuff. And then I have my moments where I'm like, that's a word that I used to know that I don't know right now. So I will do my best. But that sounds like fun. <laughs> it it sounds like we're going to have an ever revolving Rolodex of vocabulary. Sometimes the SAT words will cycle in and in the words of Chris Duvos, sometimes we'll remember the $10 words, sometimes we'll remember the 10 cent words. So we'll play around with it. <laughs> sounds good. Um, so maybe to start things off, and maybe you can suggest a, a genre of soundtrack here, uh, might I suggest a lead domino that might snowball into an avalanche? I'd love to invoke the name Kara Nortman. Um, one, could you uh, describe like what the soundtrack should be? And then two, could you share the significance of Kara Nortman in your life? And who was Kara? Because Katy Perry was there, so it's just easy. I'll go with Roar by Katy Perry. Um, because I think Kara is having a roar moment. Um, Kara uh, is, is, is a VC, was a VC, is still doing venture-like things, um, but has shifted from tech investing into sports and media investing. Um, and I would put her in the category of uh, a boss, <laughs> like my daughter called me a boss lady. Um, Kara was also my mentor uh, for Kaufman fellows, you kind of always, you have a mentor um, that's sort of ahead of you in career. Um, so she's a, both been a mentor as a VC and a mentor as a mom of three um, and a mentor as a working mom. Um, and uh, Kara is incredibly insightful, um, but I think she's also pioneering and willing to take risk and willing to do hard and new things. And so um, has been incredibly inspiring to me and has helped me sort of open up um, my planning brain because that's kind of um, how my brain works and often thinking ahead um, into just exploring things that may not be obvious next steps. Um, and so her shift into the world of sports where she's incredibly passionate, especially women's sports, um, although she does both, um, creating a new fund for it, um, being a co-founder of, uh, of um, Angel City, um, 
and just being a doer uh, is incredible. So uh, I'd say Kara is an inspiration, but I think Kara is roaring right now. So I'll, I'll give her a roar. I love it. Given that the copyright strikes will have a play some genre of music that might be similar in nature. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> Um, or you just get like day's... the elevator music version of it. <laughs> we'll we'll get the elevator music version of it. Um, so Tyler, if you're listening to this, um, we've put a hard task on you for for the next hour or so. <laughs> um, I'm I'm so curious because Kara was your mentor as a part of as being a, for you to be part of like Kaufman Class 25. The, there is something, and I've realized this across the board because I've also run mentorship programs as well. There's a difference between being assigned a mentor and for the mentee to finally recognize that mentor as a mentor. Was there a specific moment between yours and Kara's relationship where it went from I was assigned this mentor or I was given this mentor to I truly, truly see Kara as a mentor? I'm not sh- I'm not sure the context is there for this one. I um I selected her. So you have, you select your own mentor. Um, and so I will say, um, okay. just to give some color around it, you know, I, I do this job from Boulder, Colorado. Right. And so I have, um, my, my partners who are all, um, 49 to 58 year old males. Um, I have the benefit of some local folks who are awesome. Um, some who are regionally focused, some who kind of, um, are more broadly focused like we are. Um, but they're, they're just, um, there are not a lot of sort of GPs at larger funds with really established funds in this area. Um, and so something that was pretty meaning and has continues to be extremely meaningful to me in this industry is how um, supportive the women are of each other. Um, and in particular, in sort of shepherding next generation and, and making themselves available um, to the next generation and, and trying to change things. And off, many of us are sort of the one of at our firm. And I think, um, you know, the more experienced folks like Kara recognize that and, um, you know, just sort of want to be inclusive and bring people in and and be helpful. And so um, in thinking about sort of like who I wanted my mentor to be, I didn't actually know Kara that well. But I had had this really awesome experience with her where I was out in, um, I, I, you know, I, I, starting out, I was just like, I just got to hustle and network and be out there and, and go to stuff and show up. And um, hopefully people will want to hang out with me, right? Uh, this is a very people-oriented business. Um, and I, and I, you know, I, it's a long and, and sort of relationship-driven game in, in my mind. Um, and so I, I looked for things where we, we had some connectivity that I could just show up at. I also early on recognized that the LA ecosystem was interesting, was a little bit overlooked from an LP perspective, was coming up and part of, you know, what, what we had been doing at Foundry was sort of finding these um, pockets of, of interesting talent that sort of, um, you know, were emerging. Um, and so I spent a lot of time on the LA ecosystem and so started, you know, making friends there. And I found that people were very open um, in a way that the Bay Area wasn't as open. I have, I have a great network there now, but it was a little bit harder to sort of um, break in. Whereas LA, I think because they're the underdogs there, right? Like media and entertainment leads it. Um, so the underdogs are kind of more, um, collaborative and and welcoming. So anyway, I'd been spending time out there, but I, uh, Techstars was having music demo day and has, as they they used to have a music program. I don't know if they still have it. Um, as you mentioned, um, I'm a big music head. Um, my husband used to work in the music business. Um, and so I was like, oh, I'll just, I'll go out for that. And then I'll sort of build a trip around it. In any case, they did this funny thing where they invited all the mentors, um, and potential investors and sort of friends with the program to this like really swanky apartment. Um, and I think we thought we were going to meet with the companies ahead of demo day. And we got there and there were no founders there. And it was just investors kind of like (laughs) hanging out with nothing to do. And it was like this huge time block. And it was very unclear, like what the purpose was other than like a little bit of schmoozing. But then it was like, what are we doing here? Um, And many of us had blocked off like several hours because we thought we were going to be engaging with the founders. Um, And so um, I was chatting with Kara because she knew my team well and um, was friendly and she said, you know, I never, I never do this in the middle of the day, but like, do you want to go get our nails done? I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> and th- so this, maybe this is like the female version of like the bar or uh, 
in different times, the strip club who was like, let's go get our nails done. Um, and so we went and got our nails done. Um, and we had an awesome conversation. And I find that when you're, when you have no agenda and you're not sitting across the table from each other, but you're doing something together, like I I, I going for walks, um, and now nails, um, we just had this great conversation. Uh, and, um, there is also a thing I think with, um, this Jews, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like a different way to say it, but like, um, we, we kind of like, there's a very quick, like member of the tribe things that happens once you figure right. out that your grandparents kind of come from similar places and your upbringing and your, um, neurosis, uh, come from similar places. Um, and so we just, we just had like a nice quick bond and she was super easy to talk to and, uh, she was really kind and welcoming. Um, and, um, but I think that I think what you're talking about, which is one thing that's like an interesting piece of the the mentor mentee thing is I think over time, as the mentee, you you can bring value to the mentor. So it doesn't feel like you're just asking this person for advice constantly. And so I think that's when it shifts to being um, more interesting for, for both sides. And it feels better, I think, as as the mentee also that you feel like you're giving and then you and for the mentor, they feel like they're also getting something out of the relationship other than just the helping piece. And so I think over time, um, Kara and I have been able to have conversations where like my LP perspective perhaps was valuable to her um, and how she was thinking about things. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful um, relationship that I have and I feel lucky to um, have, have gotten my nails done with her that one time. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, I, I love it. I freaking love it. Um, I will say there are many activities that we typically regress to, at least in the Bay area. It's like drinks, it's going to a game. It's, um, it's doing like, I, I, I don't know if this is more bro to be completely honest, but, um, as I started hanging out with some of my, my, my partner's friends and we, we go to like the sauna and we go to like, you know, just massage parlors and all that. Holy cow. There is a world of difference when you are relaxed and you just have very human conversations. It's not about work. It's not about like all these other things. It's just like, you know what, like, like what dogs we like, what things we're seeing, what food we like, how we're making our next dish kind of thing. And it's, it feels nice to be living in 2024 when you have those conversations because too much, too many of other conversations end up being very cerebral and very, I wouldn't call it show offy, but there's some level of ego, either personally or otherwise, in the mix where you're like, oh, I've got to, I've got to look good in front of this person. We're all just humans. And if you can just remember that, it goes a long way to building relationships, to finding the appropriate time to have certain conversations. Um, and it really comes down to trust. And I feel like if you can, um, you know, in some ways disarm people by being vulnerable, by being open, um, by by sharing and including and, and things like that, um, it really does build trust in a way that can be foundational um, for the more, you know, professional things that we all need to be doing. I 100% agree. Um I'm curious, are there things and like, you know, this this might be more of a whiplash of a left turn, but um, are there things people have done for you, founders, GPs, LPs, otherwise, that have helped you become more vulnerable? And knowing that in, in sharing this, this might not be a path that, you know, the next hundred people reaching out to you might find to be special. But have there been things that people have done for you with you to help you both open up to each other? I think that when you are in a position where it's very clear that you are sort of the most experienced, most powerful, whatever in the room, and you have the emotional intelligence to understand how that may make everybody else feel. Um, and you can do something to, again, disarm everyone. I think that that goes a long way. Um, so the example, so one, one example is something someone gave me that I use. Um, and the other example is just a, a way somebody shows up. So I'll, um, uh, and there's probably more, so I'll, I'll, I'll be noodling on that as I go. But, um, so I am, 
a board observer in a company called Speckett that's in Foundry's portfolio. I love the Series A of that company. It was sort of in our um, this sort of network driven approach that we take, which is that um, actually two of our partner funds. So we invest in seed funds. We invest directly in the companies. Direct investing is the, the core of what we do. Um, the seed funds is only 25%. Um, we like the return, return profile. We like the risk mix. Um, and we like the deal flow that it, that it comes from. We could talk more about um, how we do that and, and our approach to that. In any case, uh, we led spec at Series A. It was in two of our partner funds. Um, and I joined as an observer um, because we kind of had like good folks in the mix around the table. Um, and one of my co-leads uh, took the board seat. Um, and I show up at all the meetings as though I'm on the board. Um, I'm very close to the founder. I try to be as useful as I can be. Um, and there is a board member, um, I will name him because it's a nice thing I'm going to say, is Dan Scheinman. Um, <laughs> and Dan, like, if you look at Dan's LinkedIn, like, that's intimidating, right? Like, Dan was a big time executive. Um, he's gone on to Angel Invest. Uh, he is on public company boards, including the Zoom board and others. Um, and he knows a thing or two. Um, but what Dan does is he is, he just does a really nice job of, um, not only ingratiating himself by kind of, um, you know, like the, the way he shows up as sort of not like, I know everything. He's very, um, he's very good at communicating, uh, his trust in other people, um, understanding sort of what the people operating the business on a day-to-day -day basis know about the business versus what the board knows about the business and things like that. Um, and he's, um, just very thoughtful, I think, in his delivery of feedback, and he can read the room. Um, but for me, something that Dan did uh, on a number of occasions, the first couple times um, that we were in board meetings together, is he would reach out after and give me really kind, positive feedback. Uh, and like something like that just goes such a long way. Um, for someone like me that at the time was like newer to direct investing, newer to being on boards. Um, I think I look pretty young. I'm older than maybe I look, but like one of the younger <laughs> people in the room. Uh, and so, um, I, I think that there's just like, just kind of acknowledging where people are and making an effort to make them feel good. Not because, you know, you're just doing it to be nice, but because, it has an effect, right? That gives me more confidence to come to the table and voice my opinions um, or, you know, go out of my way to do something that I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I should be doing this, whatever it is. Um, and to go to Dan and have honest conversations with him about what's happening at the company and how we can help them. Um, and so I think that there is, there's benefit to everybody in being like that. And I think there's very little benefit to making sure that you keep everybody in their place. And I think that that's a big shift that's happening right now um, in work and with generational changes and things like that. So, um, so that's one thing. It's just kind of like recognizing people um, and making it clear that, Hey, even though there's a, a giant Delta between our levels of experience, you are bringing value to the table. I am interested in your perspective. Um, uh, and, and I'm here to, to sort of be a peer. Um, the other thing I'll mention, which is something that someone gifted me um, unknowingly that I have used and has um, really become a part of, um, I won't say my shtick, but like the way that I um, do introductory calls with founders um, and feels like, like, so it really just resonated with me and, and it, I, I very much enjoy employing it is um, Jonathan Triest, who is at Ludlow Ventures, which is a, a foundry partner fund. Um, and just a wonderful human who, whom I consider, um, a friend, uh, and, uh, has just been a, a kind and thoughtful person towards me always. Um, this is actually in a Kaufman session. Like, I don't, I don't think he ever said this to me directly, but he was, um, in one of our Kaufman sessions talking about, um, you know, how he, uh, works with founders. And I think this was, I don't know if he, he's always done this or if this was like a post COVID, Hey, we have to do things on zoom now. So let's adjust to that. Um, but when he gets on a call with a founder, he, or this is what I, this is my version of it. Cause I actually, I think I remember what he said, but this is what I do now. So you get on a call with a founder and you say, really excited to talk about your business. If you would humor me, 
can we spend one or two minutes? Tell me who you are as a person. And there are two rules. You cannot talk about where you've gone to school and you cannot talk about what you've done for work. And I will reciprocate. And so there's often like a, here's where I'm from. Here's what's important to me. Um, the people that can't do it, I think it's really telling. Like some people cannot do it and they're like, I went to Harvard and then I worked at McKinsey. And you're like, that's not what, that's not what the exercise is. Oh, that's not right? the purpose of that. Um, and I, right. And so, but there's something telling in, in how people talk about themselves because it's kind of a hard question okay. and they're never prepared. Um, and then I always do the same. And, and like, you know, I, my fun fact is I've never been to Vegas um, and I can tap dance. Those are my two fun facts. Um, uh, but I think there's like, when you have this quick personal connection and a quick chuckle, it really just changes the tone and the dynamic of the interaction in a way where, I don't know, I just feel like you can have a, a better conversation um, and you can have a little bit of trust so that when you ask a hard question, like they know you're not a mean asshole because you you get you cared enough to like ask hey, where you're from, who are you, right? Um, and so I... I it's really gone a long way for me and I enjoy it. And I think um, the feedback that I've gotten is that it's refreshing. Um, I've noticed that like with certain folks, I'm always hesitant to do it and I do it anyway. And I think it's, it's worth doing every time. Hard to do with a larger group um, and when you have a limited amount of time. But I do think um, I do think it does make a difference. So. There's a nugget there that you mentioned where it's like there are certain folks that you find it harder to do it with. Are these the graduated from Harvard, went to McKinsey folks, or are there another subset of individuals that you, at least first impression wise, may, may be harder to? Yeah. And it's, and it's clearly a judgment and a um, stereotyping that I'm doing, but um, no, it's not the Harvard McKinsey types because I like doing it to them because it's kind of, <laughs> it's like funny to have them do the exercise because that's very hard because that's such a big piece of their identity. Um, it, I, I find that when it's with like, a very seasoned male CEO. Oh, where I'm like, I don't know if you're gonna like this, or if you're if this is gonna like disqualify me from you taking me seriously. Um, but at the same time, if it does, that's fine because like I want to filter that out anyway because I think building businesses is, is hard, and we need to form partnerships. Um, and I also I want it to be fun. That's like a yeah a values thing for me. Uh, and so I, I want people to be able to be humans. I think organizations where folks can be humans at all the levels of the organization will will do better. You should be the spokesperson for this podcast, by the way. Like that's the whole purpose of <laughs> <laughs> the podcast, helping LPs be more human. Are you hiring? Like, I, I, I don't think I have the budget to, 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 to pay your salary in complete honesty, but well, I would love I to hire you. I never have to hear the soundbite, then I'm okay with it. <laughs> That's true. We'll, we'll get the AI. We'll, so we talked about this in the, the pre-chat. We'll get the AI that'll transform our voice yeah. just a little bit. So it doesn't sound like the, the voice in which we hate to listen to. Let's be honest. We, in fairness, like I, I myself in, in um, editing this and recording this. And as our editor gets back to me, I'm like, holy freak, I sound horrible. Um, is this what people <laughs> listen to all the time? Um, anyways, I digress. Um, <laughs> I, I'm curious. Um, you mentioned a couple great tidbits on sitting on boards and being like human with founders. How many? How much of that? Those lessons are cross applicable to being an LPAC member as well. Are there? What are the similarities and differences between being a board member or a board observer to being an, a, a helpful LPAC member? Yeah. So um, I would say, in just like as a high level rule, um, the way I think about this, I. I I feel like a lot of things apply from like the founder VC relationship to the VC LP relationship. And often when I'm talking through um, challenges with GPs, I say, what would you say to your founders? And then it's like, oh, okay. Um, Cause you're running, you're running a business. And if you're an emerging manager, it's a startup. Um, and so there actually are a lot of similarities. Um, so I think where the, the way that I view the, the board work is as soon as you write that check, you are a partner. You are no longer being sold. You're in. Um, it gets complicated when you have opportunity funds and when you're a major league life cycle investor. And I could talk about that a, a different day. Um, but for the most part, like you're in, you wrote your check, you may make a follow on decision. Um, 
but at that point you are partners, you go forward together and, and sort of the foundry philosophy is like the board is an extension of the team. The board works for the CEO. Um, and you know, she should bring the board in as much as she wants for help, but you should create a dynamic where one, your board meetings as an early stage startup are not a quarterly reporting call. Um, and so like, where's the meat? What are the problems? Let's dig in and let's all have trust that you can tell us the truth. And we take that truth and try to figure out what to do with it versus worry about that truth and fire you. Right. Which is, I think like the, right. that's a big thing for founders to get over. I think with, um, with LPAX, it's different for a couple of reasons. One, um, if I'm a, if I commit to this fund, I commit to this fund, I'm in, um, you know, things can happen and, um, there are, you know, certain rights that you negotiate the LPA, but for the most part, like I'm in, I believe in you, let's go do the thing. Um, but in three years, you're going to come back and you're going to pitch me again for your next fund. And then three years after that, you're going to come back and you'll pitch me again for your next fund. And three years after that, you're going to come back and pitch me again for your next fund. And so it's a little bit different where I feel like mm-hmm. the LPAC is only going to be so involved and the GPs are only going to be so in- open with the LPAC because of that dynamic, which is mm-hmm. a, which is a very different one. Um, you know, something similar to think about is like I often tell GPs, hey, like an LP may pass on this fund. But in three years, they're a target for you again. And in three years, they might be a target for you again. And so that's also a little bit different with the, the founder um, VC relationship versus the LPGP relationship is that like, you know, you're always kind of built, you're always fundraising, you're always building those relationships for the future. But in any case, um, so the yeah. LPAC thing, like you're not going to be as involved. Um, there is less for the LPAC to like actively do. Um, but I think LPACs are generally very underutilized um again in the sense where it's not like let's create work for you to report to this board of people um but often like you know especially with solo gps but even newer smaller teams emerging managers um you do your thing in your silo and you don't totally know like what the norms are what our best practices how are others faring with this um, or just needing a sounding board because, again, like I said, it's a startup. You're running a company. Um, right. And it's nice to have a sounding board. And it's also nice to have a forcing function to on a quarterly or six month or 12, whatever the basis is, to take a look at your business, you know, take a step back from the day to day deals and fighting fires and talking to founders and take a step back and look at like, how is this business doing and how is this portfolio doing? And let's think about that. Um, and I often find that like LPACs sometimes, you know, because they are supposed to approve things, the conversations are not particularly, um, I don't know what the right word is, but it's like, I, it's often like, Hey, we really want to do this thing and we've already done all the work. And so we just need LPAC approval, but like, we're basically going to do it anyway. And so if you, if you, that you're just like missing the leverage of, what could be, hey, we're thinking about doing this thing. I'd like to have a real conversation about it um, b- before I get to a point where it's basically already done and I'm just asking you for final sign-off. And and very rarely is any LP going to step in and be like, no, you cannot. I will not give you that approval because um, it's just kind of not the way it works. Um, and so I think especially for the earlier, newer folks, especially the ones who have experienced LPs around the table who happen to have an emerging manager program, like go to them often and just talk through stuff. It doesn't necessarily need to be fund management related or LP related. It can be just to have a sounding board to think about a, what's going on with a company um, or something like that. So I um, I would say that uh, company boards, more active, closer to what's going on, can be more impactful. I think for LPACs, um, I expect I expect less interaction, but I'm always willing to do more. <laughs> gotcha. Um, it sounds like a lot of people use their LPACs reactively as opposed to proactively. Um, it's a great in the sense of way to sum like, it up. And let me know if I'm putting words in your mouth because sometimes I might be hearing a different narrative than the one you're you're you're, you're saying. Um, 
I'm curious on the, the the side of the L pack versus board member in the world, uh, and this is going to show how how little salt and pepper I have in my hair. But um, in the world of startup boards, you often have an independent board member who can help uh, make decisions and be the unbiased opinion on the startup board. Is there an equivalent in an LPAC? And also to demystify this a little bit for our audience in terms of, L- we're saying the acronym LPAC a lot, but it stands for Limited yes. Partner Advisory Committee. Um, and it usually, and correct me if I'm wrong here, usually comes into play when you write a sizable enough of a check or you come from enough experience as an LP where the fund manager wants you on board or you're just taking like 10, 20% of the fund and you're like, I would kind of like to see where the emerging manager is going. Um Yes. Anyways, I just wanted to define that for our audience. So that, so yes, that is what an LPAC is. Um, I should also. There's also a legal difference. Um, there's different, like so, with an actual board, um, the board, the board, the board's response, legal responsibility is to manage the company, um, mm-hmm. and you have fiduciary duties as an individual in being on that board. I believe it to be different for an LPAC. Um, gotcha. So just a thing to note. Um, so yeah, limited partner advisory committee. There are cases where um, GPs will have advisors. Sometimes those advisors have written a check. Sometimes they haven't. Um, and sometimes they will give the advisor a small percentage of carry to be an advisor to the fund. Um I don't often see those advisors participating in the LPAC, um, if I think about it, but I do believe that, you know, the, the GPs are going to them sort of separate from the LPAC, probably more often, frankly, hmm. um, probably more than proactively. CLPs, because again, it, more pro- there's again, there's this dynamic where it's like, even though you're already in, I'm still going to pitch you again and you get to make a new decision about whether you back my fund. And it just makes it, a. it just, and there's not really much to be done about that. It's just kind of the way it is. And with institutional LPs, there's such high turnover in, in kind of like their institution where sometimes you're, you're going back to the same like fu- like firm LP in three years, but it might be a completely different individual you're pitching to who does not have nearly the amount of context as the, pers- the previous person you you pitched to. Yes, um, there are benefits to that, which is that um, if your LP turns over and goes to another place where they are not already an LP, oh yeah, you might get another check. So that's the benefit. And that's, again, the, the value in playing the long game. Um, and the challenge, yes, is that it, it does turn over. So you have to create a new relationship with whoever the new folks are that take over the relationship. And sometimes it's hard to get their attention. Um, sometimes that person had a like backed you as a pet project and nobody likes that project and they're done. Sometimes a new CIO comes in. And so you still have your same people, but the new CIO is like, I hate early stage venture. It's stupid. We're not doing this anymore. Um, (laughs) It happens quite more often than you think it does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have large corporations like and large banks that all of a sudden spin up an emerging manager program and two years later, that's dead. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Foundry Group because we'd be remiss not to talk about Foundry in the course of this conversation. Um, You've spent a lot of time working with Lindell, um, who comes from the endowment world, and you know from the univ- uh, He's been at the University of Texas and early, uh, was an early backer in Union Square Ventures, True Ventures, IA Ventures, just to name a few. Um, I'm curious, as you've grown as an LP since 2016, um, what was one of the first or uh, lessons that you learned working alongside him? A couple things, a lot of things. Um... Uh, and just a giant shout out to Lindell um, because he changed my life by taking uh, a chance on a pretty miserable lawyer <laughs> that wanted out. So, um, so many things. Um, one thing Lindell taught me is how much of a human business this is, um, and that you know relationships over transactions, um, and that's kind of rings true to maybe how I come to things anyway. Um, and so it's it's kind of nice that that's the way it goes uh, in this business. Um, I'll just I'll just like list off some of the tidbits. So one is um, 
body language, in particular amongst partners. Um, partnership risk, so just for context, a lot of the investments in funds that we've made at Foundry have been emerging managers, sort of in the newer category of managers. Um, and then there's there's a number that are sort of access plays where we backed the likes of USV and True and Founder Collective and Freestyle and firms that were a bit more established. Um, but a lot of what's in my head is around the emerging side um, as we were sort of evaluating new groups to come in. So one of the biggest risks you take, um, and it's similar to, to investing in startups, is team risk. Um, and partnerships are hard. Um, interestingly, I've only ever worked in organizations led by partnerships because I worked in law firms and then I came into a venture firm. Um, and I will tell you, I think most VCs will agree that, um, uh, decision by committee is not the best way to make decisions. Um, and it's hard to not have a CEO. Um, and so partnerships are challenging for that reason, where at the end of the day, you're kind of doing everything together and you can, you can siphon off areas where people are stronger or, or responsible, but as a partnership, you make the decisions together. Um, mm -hmm. And as you're building a new brand and doing new things, like the, the decisions you make matter. And so um, the ability for partners to make decisions together and then also disagree and commit uh, is yeah. really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's just about the chemistry and that they want to spend time together and that they can have hard conversations and that they can disagree um, and commit and that they can trust each other um, to go take a swing at something that the other one doesn't totally see and then not see, I told you so a hundred times if it doesn't work out. Um, uh, and that they can uh, ham and egg a little bit, uh, to use a funny golf term that I find amusing because I'm like, who's the well, ham actually, and who's I am the egg? unfamiliar with like, this. Which is one better? Term. Yeah, like when one person's oh. doing well, the other person, you know, like when one person's not doing well, the other person like hits a really nice shot, like when you play with a team. Um, gotcha. But I always laugh because I'm like, is the egg better or is the ham better? Who do you want to be? Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, and so and so you're looking for balance, but at the end of the day, if you look at at venture firms or just companies that don't work out, it's so often people dynamics and and not the other stuff. And in venture, you have so little control <laughs> over the outcomes. Um, like it's it's about seeing the best deals. Picking them, weighing them, and yeah, you can help. And there is a, there is a lot of value to be added, but those first pieces matter a ton. Um, right. And there's less and less control, sort of, once you make the investment. Um, and so, yeah, you might end up with a shitty portfolio, but um, the thing that by the time you know that, or anybody knows that, you've probably raised another fund if it was looking good enough. And so, the reason that they usually don't work out is because of the partnership dynamics. Um, so anyway, so we're we really focus on that, um, and we like to ask hard questions, and we like to see the body language around those questions. Like, hey, you're starting a new firm. How do you fire each other? Like, what happens if this doesn't work? Um, how are the economics split? Does that feel fair to everybody? Um, how are you going to make decisions? Uh, you know, things like that. And then, you know, what are your values? And that's where, like, the human side and going out to dinner with people and seeing how they treat the server and how they treat the assistant and things like that. Um, how they talk about their spouse, whatever it is, there's lots of little clues to how a person's going to behave, in particular, how a person's going to behave when things are hard and stressful. Um, that is important. Uh, with, with also, like, if you're doing a meeting with two partners and it's very clear one person is not psyched about what the other person is saying, um, mm -hmm. or they talk over each other, or one person clearly dominates the conversation, but they're supposed to be viewed as equal, there's lots of things like that that are sort of signals for where this might go. Um, yeah. And what you're trying to do is, is avoid that that partner risk. So, I mean, some people will not invest in new teams, period. They'd rather back a solo GP than a new team that hasn't worked together before. And, and, and I get that. So um, looking for body language, looking for partner dynamics, those are important. Thinking about the human, we talk about like good human, top of the funnel. Um, and that, you know, the, the long-term relationship, you know, relationships over um, transactions. And one step further to that is like, these partnerships are really long. You can say a fund lasts 10 years. It probably lasts 20 years, like until it's all said and done. And, and then you're going to keep extending that if you continue to back this firm. Um, you have to like the people and want to spend time with them. And yes, the goal is to find people that are going to make a lot of money, but there's a lot of people that are going to make money. And um, sometimes you just don't want to be in business with a person that does business a certain way. 
and that's okay. Um, and so that's, that's like a thing that I think helps to not chase hype, um, or sort of go against your gut because like, oh, I have to be in this thing. It's like, mm, you don't. Um, and often mm -hmm. those gut feelings will, will save you down the line. Um, so that's another one. Um, and then the thing that I'm, that I, to this day, I'm not great about, which you can tell by the way I'm rambling in this podcast is, um, that silence is golden. Um, and allowing for pauses and sitting there in silence until the <laughs> other person says something more than maybe they were intending to say because it's so uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's a brilliant tactic. Uh, it is hard to do, but I try. I agree. I mean, I am practicing the craft of silence through this podcast because the goal is, I mean, selfishly speaking, I am learning a lot every time my guests open up their mouth and my whole wish is for them to speak more. Um, I want to double click on some things you mentioned earlier, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned that you'd like to ask very pointed questions to partnerships to understand how much how much partner risk there is so to speak right and some of the questions in which you mentioned included one like you know how do you fire a partner or how do you make decisions are there any examples in which you can give that of of great answers you've heard of i mean even for that question like how do you fire a partner or how do you fire each other um are there good answers to that that you've heard over the years I would say an answer is a good answer because a lot okay. of the time they haven't thought about <laughs> it. Um, so I don't, a lot of this stuff is like, you know, especially with the early stage with smaller funds, like there's a lot of many different ways you can do this and be good at this business. Um, we're always looking for like, how do you play to your strengths and making sure like you really believe in the model and it's, and it's well thought out. And so that's really what we're looking for is like, this is well thought out and it makes a lot of sense. So it's not like every partnership should be completely equal or everything has to be consensus or like we believe in consensus versus voting or we believe that, you know, you can't have a managing partner and people with less power. Like it, none of that is there's no hard and fast rules, but it needs to track to the thing and what you're looking at and needs to make sense there. So, again, like I don't think there's a good answer. I think a good answer is one that's well thought out where the team's clearly talked about it and had conviction or a fine answer is that's a good question. We had not gotten there yet. That's clearly a conversation that we need to have. We have a very healthy way of having these hard conversations. We work with a coach or a facilitator. We carve out time once a month to have an offsite and focus on these things, whatever it is. Um, that's what we're looking for is like thinking about it, having thought about it and having an approach gotcha. to how you're going to handle it. I love it. All right. There's lots for me to think about because I've never thought about kind of the question. And now that I feel like I got to ask the question as I'm personally investing into fund managers, like if there is a partnership, how do you think about difficult conversations? I think that I get that part, but I never ask the question, how do you fire each other in case things go wrong? And it's funny because the, now that I'm thinking in hindsight, the first person even remotely brought up that concept, which actually funnily enough for the emerging LP playbook, um, happened to be Eric Bond from Hustle Fund, whom I know you know well. Oh, because I've well. probably asked him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, so maybe by ins like huge inspiration from from you and uh, Elizabeth, Eric, and and um, the team is like thinking a lot more about it. Um, I want to talk about portfolio construction. Um, as far as I know, and feel free to sec set the record straight here, um, at Foundry, you allocate about 25% of your capital into seed stage managers and 75% into Series A through C companies. How did you and your team arrive at that conclusion, at that breakdown? Why 25-75? Why, why not 50-50? Like, could you talk to me about the rationale behind that for kind of LPs out there who are thinking about a direct investment strategy as well? Yes. Um so again, in uh, portfolio construction um, is yet another piece of strategy that should play to the strengths of the firm. Um, and then also the math has to make sense. On the fun side, um, a common um, goal uh, in LP land is you want a three to five X your venture portfolio, right? Like that's, that's what we're looking for. Obviously, folks want alpha beyond that. Um, it's not as much of a power law game where you're going to have a lot of zeros. So you have to have a lot of 50 X's. 
Um, but three to five X is sort of, you know, the, the, uh, the table stakes thinking. Um, and so if you can call it four X, 25% of the portfolio on a net basis, then you're returning capital for the entire fund with just the funds piece. And it's a relatively de-risked, um, portion of the portfolio because it's it's diversified on a look through basis um you know you're looking at hundreds of companies right um uh so that's that's the that's sort of the return profile of that piece and so then you're sitting at 1x and cost returned granted that may take longer because of because of the length of the fur of the um uh, of the cash flows but it, it's Relatively de-risk. So then you're sitting at 1x, and then all of the Series A and beyond is the upside, um, mm-hmm. which can allow you to take more more risk. Um, and so we that we kind of liked that mix. Um, I think that it would be hard to pull this off in more of a co-invest type strategy, um, meaning that I don't. I think you have to have experience. And a reputation and a brand for leading or being a meaningful part of early stage um, rounds in order to really have that much of the fund. Like in order to have the core business be direct investing, you have Mm -hmm. to have real direct investing experience. And so I don't think it works as a co-invest strategy as much as it works as um, an edge, meaning we've got this portfolio of fund managers, um, we have not only written them a check um, and a check that's more than 100K, like we've written them a check. Some of them we've helped to put in business. Some of them we've introduced to lots of LPs. Um, Many of them we help with their decks and talking through what their annual meeting should look like and interviewing a potential partner and whatever it is. And so we try to be pretty hands-on and pretty useful. Um, And with that, like we have, you know, an extra trusted relationship. Um, and we also have, you know, information about the fund and about the companies. Um, and we get to track the companies sort of from the day that that, that fund announces that they made a pre-seed or a seed investment to the time when um, they're leading up to, to a series A or B or something that's more our stage. We get to meet those founders at the events. Um, we get to see who they picked to present at the annual meeting. Um, so that we that's a, that can be viewed as an edge where there's a relationship um, and somewhat of an information advantage. I don't know that the information advantage is that strong, like from a reporting perspective. Like I'm not sure that there's right. that much in there that you can't glean on the internet. But I think it's more about the signal that you can get from the managers um, in both in how they talk about the company, and then the, there's the ability also. It, there's also an edge in just a focusing mechanism. Right. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of companies. And so thinking about where you have an edge and where you want to focus, most companies that get to a series A or B have raised a seed round um, from a a real seed fund. And we've picked 30 something of the ones that we think are the best. Uh, uh, And so why not focus there? It doesn't mean it's the only thing we'll do. Um, but it does mean that it gives us a, gives us a place to focus um, that energy on sourcing and uh, from like sort of the outbound perspective. Um, and then I think winning, you, you know, you have a different re- conversation with the founders, which is like, hey, I'm already on your cap table. I want you to do well. Um, I have indirect exposure. Let's have a, just a conversation about your business. You don't need to pitch me. And then when you're ready to pitch, like I'll, I'll, I will already know you um, and we'll already have that. But let me like let me help you out because you're in the family. So it's, it's just like right. a little bit um, different and, and we view that as an edge. So that's how we came up with that portfolio construction. I'm curious on the world of like the, the 25%, right. With the, the seed stage managers and all um, it is, it sounds like an access play for, for, for a lot of betting on emerging managers, as well as kind of the more established managers in which you, you fund. Um, how much of the calculus is dependent on, potential overlap in the future of the portfolio. For example, Mm -hmm. I assume of the 30 or so managers, they're not all, I'm making this up, consumer consumer tech investors, right? Because then there's there's a high likelihood of overlap. Um, How do you think about the 
if there are, uh, how do you think about the buckets? Um, so for us, we're pretty broad, like just as a, um, just for context, we're pretty horizontal. So we, we do consumer and enterprise, but we're all tech. And there's a lot of things we don't do. Like we don't do biotech and life sciences directly. It's not a thing that we think we have expertise in. Um, we think there is a lot of money to be made there. Um, but it's not a thing that we're, where we feel like, you know, we're well positioned to win. Um, and so it does play into it in, in how we picked. Um, but you also want to have exposure to lots of things. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the foundry way of doing things was a bit more tailored to the types of opportunities we would want to invest. And by the way, we had, we had sourced many investments from many folks in this group before we ever had this, you know, formal strategy. Um, and uh, it's also a way to learn a little bit about areas or to get exposure to areas that we think we might be interested in, but where we don't necessarily have expertise. Like you want exposure to some of that. Um, we've done a little bit in crypto, but we have some crypto funds. Um, we, um, you know, we, we've had some funds that focus on consumer. We haven't done a ton of consumer, but we've done some. Um, and so I think that there's, for us, there's definitely a desire for overlap because the core business is investing directly in companies. I don't think that that's necessarily should be the case for LPs that want to have a co-invest program. Because again, I don't, I don't think most LPs are equipped to be really like coming in and leading those rounds and competing with the other VCs out there to lead those rounds. And so in a co-invest right. program, yes, you have to do your own work, but you also have to trust the managers um, to be showing you things that are appropriate for you. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so in some cases, I, I, or I would say for most LPs, that really shouldn't be the driver of it, but there are LPs out there that have like a, a real direct investment team. And their mm -hmm. entire goal is is to do the next round or have a co-invest program. And so I think that there needs to be a a bit of a balance. It's so funny. I can never get it to do that when I want it to. Um, but then, like, I guess I talk with my thumbs more often than I realize. I didn't even know um, that was possible in complete honesty. And I've yeah, been no, using this platform for a minute. A lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for us, it... it, it, it it does matter. And we definitely, like, we didn't do pure play biotech or life sciences funds. That said, there are some of our funds that, that because they're so early um, and they have a perspective in certain areas, they will do things in that space or CPG things or whatever. Um, and we're in space tech, like another area where we, we don't really do anything directly. Um, healthcare, um, where we've done some, but not a ton. And so I think it's good to have that exposure. And I think it's LP you want to make sure you have both. You want to make sure, sure, you have some overlap if you have a real co-invest um, strategy, um, but you want the diversification of, of the opportunity. That makes sense. Um, and I know we're getting up on time here. So as we're we're sliding into okay. the back half, um, I don't want to forget <laughs> our jukebox just yet. So I'm, I'm going to put that. Oh, yeah. I know we're going to put that ball back in your core here. Um, but maybe like my last like venture LP kind of question. Um, I'm I'm curious. Um, so you've you've known um, the team at Basis Set for a while, uh, Shreya Jao at Basis Set, and um, as someone who met her right when they closed their first fund, so obviously they weren't accepting any LP commitments, but wanted to invest in their fund too. How did you keep Foundry top of mind for them between those fundraises? Yeah, and I am envious of how easily you say Lon's first name because I often fail at it so i just call her lawn um <laughs> lawn, so, lawn works just as well i will say i come from a man yeah descent. i i've practiced it with her and yeah i know <laughs> so it's a, little, it's a little unfair but um, um but maybe yeah. start us uh, with the song first before you you dive in oh what song does lawn get i know man lawn is just I'll, I'll give lawn unstoppable by sia i told you I, i'm having this like this moment of like female empowerment so i have a whole playlist around it um i'm all for i need that spotify playlist by the way so I, i'll ask you for that it's later it's really good it's really good um god lon is just such a force and she's such a unique individual and it's just so awesome um and is what it, like one of my favorite people um so yeah i'll get i'll give lon unstoppable for now but I'll, I'll i'll think if there's anything else that comes to mind um so i met lon i was introduced to lon uh, as the second ludlow reference of, of the day uh, by brett at ludlow and she was coming out of Dropbox, raising that first fund. It went pretty quickly. Um, and she was like 
sort of closing it up when we met. So I, I was brand new, um, and uh, the, like it was more like, hey, I don't, I don't think that we're a target for this, but you're interesting. I'd love to meet you. Um, and then you know, there's so much serendipity and like universe stuff in this business. I just happened to like sit next to her at a, a number of lunches and just run into her in places. Um, and kept the conversation going, and she just was like so impressive. And I meet a lot of fund managers, and it's hard for people to stand out. We all kind of do the same thing: we shuffle money from one pile, uh, pile to another. Um, and she just was, you know, like I just knew she was special when I met her, um, and just her vision around what she was trying to build and why it was differentiated and. Sort of leveraging the experiences she had, both in studying psychology, but then also、um, inside of companies and in、um, in corp dev, and kind of bringing that all together to just build something that was different.、Um, hustle factor out the wazoo. I mean, is there a song about hustle? Because that would be、um, yeah.、Um, I'm a hustle baby. It's what you know for fun with that.、Uh, Now I now I've sang on your podcast, so I'm definitely not listening. I know, or we're gonna get flagged.、Um, we're gonna get flagged just because you said that、uh, one <laughs> lyrical line. <laughs> oh yeah, now, now you have to pay the royalties.、Um, I know. Thank you. Thank anyway, you for increasing、um, the the,、so、the cogs just, of, of the pod. So、uh, IQ EQ grit off the charts,、um, edge really strong. Um, and then you start talking her about how to use AI, not just how to invest in AI before that was cool, but how to leverage AI to build real systems inside of a venture organization to help them run the business. And this was at a time where a lot of people were pitching like data, 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 and this is how we're going to make our decisions. Like we're going to put in the pedigree and the this and the that, and it's going to tell us which ones to do. And she she had a very、um, Like Lon's an excellent、um, combination or a special combination of technologist and humanist,、um, and it's rare to find those. And so recognizing, like, yeah, there's a ton of data and there's a lot we can do with technology, but those will those that will augment the decisions that we made. It will make it will not make the decisions for us. And so that resonated with us because we we kind of heard the other side of the data thing, and we we're like, I don't think that's going to work. I think at the earliest stages, you're make you're still making people bets,、um, right? And maybe we're getting to a point where we're like we're going to be able to know a lot more about people based on data about them. But it, there's there's still a little bit of gut and luck and and those kinds of things in this in this business. And so I think Lon has a real appreciation for that, even though she's also trying to do something different. So anyway, so we just stayed in touch. I tried to be helpful where I could in thinking about、um, institutional LPs and how to kind of shift from what her LP base looked like to what she wanted it to be. Um, I made introductions for her. I'm not sure that she, you know, at the end of the day, needed those introductions.、Um, but、um, like I said, it, it, it's it's a long game. It's relationships.、Um, you just you just do stuff for other people and help people that are interesting and that you like, and you figure it'll come back to you.、Um, you know, we've now done a deal with Lon.、Um, we've now invested in two funds with her and team. Um, and you know it's just fun, and she's fun because she's got fire,、um, and she's excited, and she's specific about what she's doing.、Um, and by God, if she tells me not to do a deal, I should not do it. I've learned that lesson. So <laughs> <laughs> listen a lot. That's the that's that's the moral of the story.、Mm-hmm. Um, amazing. So okay, we are now properly in the fourth leg of the relay race, and as we're in the tail end. Probably just like one more genre of song. You can pick rock, punk,、mm. heavy metal. It's funny. I'm a big rock fan, but I've I've given you two pop songs, so I gotta I gotta switch gears. All right, so maybe we'll go we'll go we'll go rock in, in the back half here, and and, and Tyler will, will、okay. tune that up for us.、Um, I have two more questions <laughs> for you,、uh, and I'm curious.、Um, at, you know, you've you've self described yourself as. Probably the only VC in the world that actually watches Shark Tank,、um, and don't get me wrong, it's it's a great show. It's great entertainment. I, I think I am. <laughs> you probably are. I mean, because I've heard so many VCs, LPs talk ill of the show because it's not as everyone hates on it, but I don't think they actually watch it. Yeah. I don't think I actually watch. I think they watch the clips. They watch like the the、uh, Instagram reels, the YouTube shorts of that, and maybe those three minute chunks of highlight reels. And they're like, that doesn't look like what venture looks like. But 
if you're a student of the craft, if you're a student of the show, there's a lot more complexity that goes on into it. And I know I grew up watching Shark Tank as well. But my question to you is, what elements do Shark Tank, uh, does Shark Tank really get right that most professional investors often underestimate? I'm not sure if there's a, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if there's an answer to that. Um, I here's what I like about Shark Tank. Um, okay. One, it's just like it's fun and it's fun to play with ideas that we would never invest in because most of the time they're not like I want to like insult the sharks, but like <laughs> oftentimes they're not like they don't feel like venture investable deals like yeah. for a classic like what we do. A lot of those folks are investing their own money. And they have platforms that make sense for a lot of this, like more consumer focused um, stuff. And by the way, a lot of those VCs also invest in a lot of other stuff that, that would never end up on Shark Tank. But what I love about Shark Tank is that it reminds us um, that like this should be accessible to everybody. And there's lots of people out there with great ideas. Um, and I just like some of the magic of at least what the American dream is supposed to be and what this country is supposed to be about is opportunity. And that like, there's like this entrepreneurial DNA to people that left where they were, whether it was on the Mayflower or as a refugee or as someone that just wanted to be here um, and came to this place to do something different, even if it's just to get a job. Like it's entrepreneurial to leave and do something new um, and think about starting a new and starting a different life for yourself. And so that's why I love Shark Tank because there's like, there's the magic in it. Um, it's it's also just like pretty amusing to hear, you know, the responses and, um, and all of that. But I just, I think it's actually really inspiring. I think it's great for kids to think about what could be um i think it's also helpful for people to hear that certain businesses are not good businesses um and aren't like are not going to make money or should not take on investment um and you get that feedback too um it, it's also an easy way for me to describe to my parents what the hell it is that i do because uh, they, they still think i'm a lawyer i'm pretty sure so um, <laughs> <laughs> with I all just, the legal I, jargon I think, that goes I, I think around like yeah i feel like we have this like this this attitude that we're so special because we're VCs because we somehow lucked into, and I put myself in this category, completely lucked into a world that most people can't even fathom um, as far as how much money we throw around and how flexible our schedules are and the fun stuff we get to work on, and the problems we get to solve and the impact that some of these things have. Um, and so like, I am not above Shark Tank and I have no problem with that. Um, and I think it's fun. Yeah. I agree. I actually wrote a blog post probably a couple months back, at least at the time of this recording, um, about there was a Shark Tank episode where they had, I think it was the founder of Gorilla Glue or something, um, went on with his son to pitch this brand new product. And I think it was Mark Cuban or something asking, why are you doing this? You're independently wealthy because of Gorilla Glue. Or I think it was Gorilla Glue or something. Um, and I'm summarizing and I'm butchering it, but highly, highly, highly rec recommend people to check out that episode, just Shark Tank, Gorilla Glue founder and all that. You'll find tons of reels on this. Okay. But um, effectively, he's like, you know, I decided to do this for for my son because I'm going to pass away before my son does. And I want to give my son something else to like be proud of on uh, and not live in like my legacy. And I thought it was just such a heartwarming moment. It's not a typical like venture investable so, deal. There's but... so many of those. No, there's so many yeah. of those moments. Can I tell you a funny Gorilla Glue story? Yes, go for it. I, I promise I'll, I'll let you, we can go over time. Um, this is just like a totally random story. You don't have to um, <laughs> put this in the episode, but I just, it cracks me up if every it's time. hilarious, we're going to include it. In high school, in high school, one of my good, dear friends, um, I was really close to she and her brother. They were like a year apart. And her parents were away. I, we were probably like juniors or seniors. And we had a huge party. Um, and on their kitchen island, they had these cabinets. And in the morning, we were like trying to get cleaned up before her parents got home. And someone had like ripped the cabinet just completely off. And so the hinge was like had broken. Right. And we were like scrambling and we couldn't figure out how to fix it. And they were going to be home. So we, we fucking gorilla glued it just shut. <laughs> 
<laughs> and her parent that was that must have been in like 2002 and they wow. sold their house this year and they just <laughs> discovered it this year when they were getting the house ready to sell it was like hey why is this gap in the glue shop so <laughs> gorilla glue works and it lasts a really long time so that's my gorilla glue that's a great story. promotion gorilla glue please sponsor the podcast while you're at it <laughs> last forever yeah glue all your cabinets shut They'll never come last forever. Um, uh, that's that's hilarious. Um, it it it's it's as advertised. Um, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good story. Um, okay. Um, and what like what one ish or well, two more questions here, if you don't mind. Um, okay. I. So personally, I love the practice of self-reflection. I love the fact that you've been like writing so much on Medium as of late. Um, and so between kind of like your partner, Brad Feld, who writes birthday uh, reflections and resolutions and your own New Year's resolutions this year in 2024 to not have any New Year's resolutions, I knew I had to ask you about them. Um, so as someone who practices daily meditation on our Peloton and as someone who believes that New Year's resolutions should include flexibility and room to fail, do you have any goals or experiences Experiences that continue to keep you humble today, um, which is why you set that resolution. So many, all of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, life is hard. Life is hard for everybody, um, and uh, and you can have all the resources in the world, and it's still hard. Um, and so, I think that's just like helpful to remember um the the meditation thing is hard to stick with i i go in spurts the 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 um, workout thing is hard to stick with the writing thing is hard to stick with um i mean i i i tried and failed very quickly to write every day for the remainder of the year when i started writing like mid-december um and then i realized a couple things one is um i'm not good at just like writing whatever and shipping it um Maybe over time you get to a point where you just don't give a shit. But um, I I view writing as one of my strengths, um, and I also am a trained attorney. And you you write perfectly when you are a trained yeah. attorney, and so it must um, be perfect out of the box. Yeah, and so that's like that's the thing that always slows me down. And then there's all of the like, well, somebody might not like this thing that I'm saying, or how is this person going to feel? As though like as though that many people are going to fucking read it, right? So if you can get over yourself, then you can you could probably ship a lot more um, blog posts. But it, the, the other piece of it is like, I have three children under six um, and I didn't do the math that they were going to be home for the final two weeks of the year. <laughs> so like, there goes my writing every day, right? Um, especially if I wanted to be any good. Um, so that was, that, that was a, a quick try and fail. But what it did force me to do was just like get over the, it has to be the best thing ever and just like push a bunch of stuff out and get some feedback. Um, uh, Daniel Feld, Brad's brother, um, gave me so much shit for, he's like, what's with your Flonase ad? He was like, you were writing all this good stuff and then it's a Flonase <laughs> ad. And I was like, tell me you didn't go buy that. And I swear, I swear by that Navaj thing, by the way, it's, it's like saved me during this uh, period. Really? Of sick all the time. I've seen it. I've um, read about it. I have it in my shopping cart. I haven't bought it yet. Tell you, man, get it. It's, it's a game changer. Um, okay. So anyway, so I like, I'd like to write more because it helps me think. I think it helps people understand how I think I like having a thing to point to. Um, especially like I get a lot of, um, uh, it's, I assume in a position like this, I got a lot of people reaching out that want to spend time with me, but they don't really like have a real thing that we, that is urgent. Um, and especially being a mom, um, and having a lot of investments to make as we, um, invest the rest of the foundry fund and, um, a lot of portfolio companies that I'm currently working with and it's a hard market. Like I just have a lot to do. So it's nice to be able to have things to point to like, Hey, if you're wondering how I think about X, like read this thing I wrote about it. So I'd like to do more of it. Um, and sometimes life gets in the way and I think that's okay. And I, I think that the, um, the takeaway I've had from like trying these more systematic, I'm going to do this every day is to just, if you're kind to yourself, then you're more likely to go back to it versus judging yourself for failing and then feeling like, well, that's not a thing that I can do. Um, and the goal is to get as much of it as I can. And so I'm going to start with like, I want to do this every day. If I can't do it every day, that's fine. Um, but being okay with 
hey, if I do, if, if there's a week that goes by and I only do it twice, that's cool. I should just like, if I have the energy, I should just go do it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, I think from a motivation perspective is every day is a new day. Every day is a new opportunity. It's like, I'm, I'm acting like I'm a big golfer. I'm really not a big golfer, but like in golf, it's like, ev- like the, the pros think about it as every hole is a new hole because you can't worry about what you did wrong in the last one. You just have to like, you're starting over for each one. And so I know that my day is better, that I am clearer in thinking that I'm more productive, that I am a happier and better person to be around, which includes being a better mom and a better spouse and a better partner and all of those things. If I work out in the morning and even better if I meditate and it doesn't have to be a long workout. Um, that's another thing I've figured out. And so to me, that's the, the workout stuff has shifted towards um, mental health more so than physical health. The other thing I discovered, which is like this really weird thing, but it's, I think is cool. And I think it kind of works is this app called Olo. I am not an investor. I don't know anything about how it. Do you, how do you spell CEO, Olo? One of our port- one of our portfolio companies mentioned on LinkedIn and I downloaded it. Um, O-L-O. O-L-O. It's like okay. weird sounds. It's like a weird sound bath, but it's not like a, like a cool, it's not like a sound bath with like all the different sound bowl things. It's like weird sound. Uh-huh. Um, there's like a, a short, medium and long version. You don't have to do anything. You just, and this is why, like the meditation thing can be hard because you're actively doing something. I use 10% happier for that. I really like it. Um, mm-hmm. But some days I just don't feel like it. And so- Olo, you can just lay there, um, put your headphones in, close your eyes, and you don't actually have to like focus or concentrate. You just lay there, and I swear to God, it does something. So, I'm going to go download that. That's a long Thank you very much. To what you asked um, me. My yeah. <laughs> my girlfriend also. Uh, I'm calling her. I apologize, um, but suffers from a little bit of insomnia here and there. Um, so this is. Oh, it can help for that too. Apparently, I'm. I, we're both going to download that, and I think it'll be better for both of us. Um, Okay, I don't want to overstay my welcome here. And I know we're running out of time. We've run out of time in many different ways yes. already. But um, and so there, there are many other questions I have, including one of which obviously of like, um, you and your partners announced 2022 for like Foundry Group was going to be the last fund. Won't touch too deeply on that. By all means, like your partners and yourself wrote so much about that topic. So I highly recommend people just to like read the medium posts, read the blog posts. It covers plenty of ground there. Um, But I'm curious, like beyond the 2022 fund and after you've deployed it, after you've helped all the companies and funds that you're investing to, what's what's next for you? Yeah, so we will be managing this fund out for a very, very long time. As I mentioned before, these things go on for a long time. And part of the decision was um, we're not going to extend that timeline beyond how far we've already extended it by raising a 2022 fund. Um, So I would say more rather than after more like in addition to uh, because continuity is really important to me. Um, I have lots of ideas um, and I've learned a lot of things, um, but I do believe that I found the right, um, the right career for me. Uh, And this feels like it's a big part of my life uh, and a a really big piece of like who I am. Um, So I want to stay in venture. Um, I would like to continue as a GP investing directly in companies, um, as much as, and I enjoy, uh, investing in funds. And that's the thing I'd love to figure out how to keep doing as well. Um, but I love working with the founders. I love working on the companies. I just, I love the, like the daily, um, reminder of possibility and of what humans can do and of all these like really incredible people that do the hardest thing in the world, which is to start something from nothing. And if I can be a small part of that, like, man, that's, that's a win for me. Um, I'd love to start something. I've always wanted to start something. Um, I've had all sorts of ideas. I, you know, I've applied to Shark Tank. They never take me. I'm joking. Um, (laughs) But uh, if Mark Cuban I, or anyone like, else I've, is like listening to this, or the producers of Shark Tank are listening to this, like let's let's flag oh, Jack. I, I want to pay. So, I, I will pay somebody else fifty to a hundred dollars a month to deal with my parents and technology. <laughs> I don't want to have to keep their passwords. I don't want to teach them how to use their phones. I don't want to like if they can, if somebody can do that, I'll pay for that. Um, can I share so, in yeah, that, so uh, I, that the resource to... as well? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a thing. Um, 
So I'd love to build something and I would love to build something that feels like mine. And I think it is incredibly hard to do that if you're not starting it from the ground floor. Um, I think it would be really fun to have um, some female partners. Um, And so like my goal is to do something with some cool peers. I don't know exactly what it looks like. Um, The timing is not uh, imminent. Uh, I have a lot of work to do at Foundry. I have a lot of new investments I'm excited to make. Um, and a lot of portfolio companies that I love working closely with. Um, so like I said, continuity will be really important. Um, and I think this is, you know, several years out, but I think starting something new, uh, is on the horizon for me. I love it. And there is no better way to end this episode than by coming full circle as (laughs) what, what Kara was for you in terms of the mentor mentee, you are looking to pay it forward for founders, for fund managers out there, um, and working close and boots on the ground with people who are just beginning um Jacqueline thank you so much and I know you're everywhere you're on the socials you're on uh LinkedIn media Twitter you name it kind of thing but if people were to pick just one place to reach out like what's the best place just email me um that's great I'm bad at responding to leaked LinkedIn I will start I will be I'm trying to write more so I'll, I'll get back up um on medium and LinkedIn it's all the same um Twitter's weird these days I will not call it x it is Twitter um, yeah, I've, I took it off my phone. I also took Instagram off my phone. I think those two decisions were good. Um, and so I, I feel like LinkedIn's kind of becoming like professional Twitter, which is great because it's easy. Um, but yeah, I'm not great at responding to those messages. So if there's, um, something you want from me, shoot me an email. It's easy to find. That's true. That's true. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been such an enjoyable episode. I, I mean, Jacqueline, you know this, I came with a gigantic deck of questions and we have only touched the tip (laughs) of the iceberg um yes so in many ways we need to have tons more chats and i'm sure our listeners are also curious but i think this is as good of a note to end on uh for at least maybe like part one of of the jacqueline okay Um, i'm I'm happy to come back one thing i i just want to say to the lps out there is that um this is going to be a very awesome time to be backing emerging managers. And I think emerging managers have been, has been redefined as um, looking more like spin outs um, with a next generation of people who are well-trained, have the early makings of track records, have strong brands and reputations, want to do things a new and different way. The industry is, is changing. There's going to be a, a, like, there's just always innovation. It just never ends we're never past an innovation cycle where at the beginning I think of one that's really interesting and so I would just be open to thinking about what that looks like what early stage venture looks like for you and just knowing like by the time the track record's really established it's almost too late um and so I I think that and I'm always happy to talk to any LPs that want to talk about this there are other ways to evaluate um whether a newer fund is going to be successful um even if the DPI isn't there yet because of just how long it takes. Um, And so you're looking for talent um, and that's, that's the thing to follow. I'm about to click recording all over again and let this start. Like, let's rewind ourselves one and a half hours back. (laughs) We'll do do a new one. Yeah, no, we can, I'm, I'm happy to do another one. Like I'd rather do this than the work that I actually have to do right now. Um, But um, you're an excellent interviewer. And so thank you. Thanks for having me. Emotional intelligence might matter more than it used to, so I'm having a moment. Hello, Supercluster fans. You've seen the logo at the beginning, and now we're here to address the elephant in the room. And the big question is, how intertwined is Superclusters and Alchemist Accelerator? And the truth is, Superclusters and Alchemist Accelerator are two completely separate entities. Other than the fact that it is only I, David, your host, who is able to traverse between the multiverses. And so the reason Alchemist is a sponsor for Superclusters is the same reason why I ended up joining Alchemist. Um, And it's for two reasons, the team and the product. So let me elaborate a little bit. For the team side, I was doing a bunch of diligence, homework, reference checks before I joined Alchemist. And I stumbled across a story which was between Ravi and an early team member of Alchemist. Um, And for the sake of this story, I'm going to call that person John. So Ravi and John were working late at night because they had a deadline coming up. And as they were about to leave, Ravi found out that John didn't have a place to stay and had been sleeping out of his car the entire time. And the next thing Ravi did literally blew my mind. 
which was Ravi gave the keys to his place to John and said, John, you're free to stay here for as long as you want. And I knew instantly that this is the team I wanted to join. This is the, the, the culture I wanted to be a part of. Um, the second thing is the product itself. Uh, Alchemist has built this really robust product called The Vault. And it is the epitome of Peter Drucker's infamous line, which is you cannot manage what you don't measure. And so for the uninitiated, what is Alchemist Accelerator? Alchemist Accelerator is your startup accelerator for companies that monetize from enterprises. And so don't take it just from me. Uh, we've backed incredible companies, including names you've heard of, LaunchDarkly, Prevacera, Mo Engage, and we're also backed by some incredible LPs and investors, including Coastal Ventures, Mayfield, Salesforce. And now, between you and I, I can't share any of the numbers, and if I do, my compliance officer, our compliance officer, will literally gobble me up for breakfast, lunch, afternoon tea, and dinner. And personally, I'm too young to die. And But I will say, the numbers, they're great. Like, they're really great. And so if you're curious and want to get involved in Alchemist um, and the ecosystem, check out alchemistaccelerator.com backslash superclusters. And that superclusters with an S at the beginning and at the S at the end. And we'll also include these links in the notes. Hey, Superclusters fans. This is David from Post and want to share a few things before you go. If you're tuning in from the YouTube universe, and if you like this episode and you want to see more of it, consider subscribing. It's free. Let us know down in the comments which LPs you'd want to see next or topics you liked and want to hear more of. If you're tuning in from the audio universe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever content finds your ear, and you liked what you heard, give us a follow. And lastly, want to share a quick disclaimer from our legal friends. While I am the head of investor relations at Alchemist Accelerator, and that Alchemist Accelerator is one of our proud sponsors, the views expressed in this episode are for informational purposes only and are solely the views of myself and the guest alone. They are not representative of Alchemist Accelerator. None of the views expressed herein constitute legal, investment, business, or tax advice, and any allusions or references to funds or companies are purely for illustrative purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment recommendations. Consult a professional investment advisor near you prior to making any investment decisions. And that's all from me. See you on the next.